We are thrilled to have Darren Ching as tonight's guest speaker. Darren is the co-owner of the Klumching Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. Founded in 2007, Klumching showcases, bless you, some of the most exciting emerging and mid-career artists in photography. Their exhibits have received critical acclaim from such publications as The New Yorker, New York Magazine, Modern Painters, Hot Shoe, and Art Review. Darren is also the creative director of Photo District News and has been instrumental in developing the visual identity of the magazine since 1999. He is also a member of that magazine's selection committee for the annual PDN's 30 Emerging Photographers issue. Additionally, Darren is a photo editor for Atlant Magazine, where he interviews photographers and curators under practice. In 2008, he curated the Photography Now show at the Center for Photography at Woodstock and was also the featured U.S. curator alongside Deborah Klumching, who is also in our audience tonight. Welcome, Deborah. Um, on the exhibition, The Architecture of Space, for the Flash Forward Festival, Toronto 2010. For more than a decade, Darren's leadership has helped shape the photo industry as a portfolio reviewer, presenter in forums, juror in competitions, and contributor to online and print publications on the subject of photography. So please help me welcome Darren to our lecture series. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Yale for, you know, for having me. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled being here. And, you know, I'm essentially going to be talking about my work from, from, two, <coughs> from two different vantage points, one from Photo District News and one from Clamp Chain Gallery. Since 1999, I've been the creative director there, and, um, you know, I'm not sure if if all of you subscribe to it or have seen the magazine, but, but if you're interested in being a professional photographer, it's, it's such a great publication. It's, it's a tremendous resource. And you know, as a magazine, you know, it's not the kind of magazine that would appeal to, you know, to like someone that's just interested in photography as a hobby. It's, it's, it's a trade publication, and, and it has, you know, it's like we have theme issues on you know, self-promotions or lighting and contracts and lots of different aspects of the photography market. And like in terms of my, you know, if I can kind of talk about just the nuts and bolts of my job there, you know, essentially I take the raw content from editorial department and I work with the photo, the photo editor and we look at the images and, and it's all about Taking the content and and laying it out in the way that's that's um, that's most reader friendly to get the content across. You know, among the thrills of of like being involved with. You know, among the thrills of being involved with this publication is um, just 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 seeing how um, the online aspect of the publication has grown. We've we've launched a few different blogs and. And like a lot of like the more immediate news, which used to find its way in print, is now online. So, um, you know, as a publication too, it's it's um, you know it exposes me to lots of different types of artwork that's out there. Because w when I first started the magazine, you know, I thought I knew a lot about photography, but but I had no idea that that there were so many genres and subgenres that are in the photo industry. And the thing I'd like to do is just kind of um, go on and talk about little, you know, bits and bobs of different images that I have a strong response to, that that I find quite fascinating, that 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 I haven't grown tired of, of, of looking at. Uh, the first image I'd like to talk about is Spencer Platt's image, which which won the World Press Top Prize in 2006. One of the reasons why I like this image is. It's it's an image that works really on a formal level, and there's like so many different things that that are going on in this picture. Because here you have a car of young affluent people 
driving through a bombed out neighborhood in Beirut. And w when the image first came out, it was extremely controversial. Um, some people thought it was a picture that was promoting war tourism, but, but, but actually in reality, these are people that, that had lived in the neighborhood and, and, and they were finally allowed you know, back there to you know, view the wreckage. But, but it's a fantastic image, and, and when, whenever I look at it, I see something new in it. You know, I have to say that um, since working at Photo District News, my favorite issue has been the PDN 30, which is a really long process. We um, spend the entire year looking for nominations and soliciting them from, from art directors and, and photo editors. And there, there are some real gems that, that I've found through that competition. And one of the photographers that, that I constantly look at is the work of Pari Dukovic. He has this really um, lively sort of street gritty type of style of shooting. And you know, there, there's like so much movement in his wor work. It might be a street scene or, or it might be like an image of Turkish wrestlers, which um, you know, it's it's black and white, it's contrasty. It it's it's a style of photography that and that that in a lot of ways it it really doesn't fit, feel like you know it would fit into editorial work. But but l during the past few years, he's been getting a tremendous amount of work through through New York Magazine. Um, here's a portrait that he sh shot of Kim Kardashian, which ended up on the cover of New York Magazine. And the interesting thing about a style is that um, you know it has its roots in 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 just kind of that urban grit, but when you see it in in like a different context, like how he shoots ballet dancers, you know it feels like a Degas, like it has that real pastel y type of feel, and the whole you know grit of his image lends itself to you know, sort of like a retro type of feel that's, that's quite sexy and it's quite, you know, it's quite evocative of, of like lots of different layers of content. You know, prior to, you know, speaking, I was trying to think about um, what type of images, you know, sort of rock my boat. And, you know, I'm very much into those type of commercial images and editorial images that 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 seem to straddle that fuzzy kind of gray area. You know, I love unexpected choices. And, you know, I think that through through a lot of books and magazines, you have photo editors um, and publishers and art directors that are taking a lot of chances and finding non-traditional photographers to shoot certain works. And um, a few months ago, I came across a spread in, in Travel and Leisure and you know it's a it's basically a travel magazine and when you think about travel you, you think about really pretty shots of streets or the coastline or restaurants but um, the photo staff at Travel and Leisure they commissioned Monica Heufler and Jen Schwarz to you know do a portrait of, of a fl flamenco dancer and and it's a very non-traditional approach like if you pick up any travel magazine and if you think that you're going to find portraiture, um, the average travel magazine won't have, have a lot of portraiture, like in this sense. And, and I also think about Moore magazine and how they had a feature on um, perception of, of women's bodies, and they hired Nadav Kandar to shoot women in fine art poses, which, which in my mind is like a, um, you know, it's a very novel way to get the content to, to get the content to get the content across, and when it gets down to it, you know, magazines mm -hmm. are about communication. So it's about you know finding the coolest way to find like the art that makes it happen. And and this spread also for more magazine shot by Toby McFarlane Pond. You know, I just love the spread because it's a great you know it's a great interplay between um, the um, the photography and the text. You know, makes a bold graphic statement. You know, and, and as you know, as some people might know, um, I'm completely obsessed with food, and I have a massive cookbook collection that 
that's like it probably runs in the neighborhood of like at least a hundred. So I've always loved looking at you know old cookbooks and new cookbooks, and I'm particularly excited by how certain cookbook publishers have been hiring non-food photographers to shoot cookbooks to get a different look. And I think that part of it has to do with the competition in the market. You know, if you go into Barnes & Noble, their cookbook section is completely overflowing with books. So every publisher wants their work to, you know, st stand apart. There was a cookbook that, that was um, shot by Angela Moore. It was, it was a cookbook on Heston Blumenthal's um, food and and I particularly I particularly like this image and and like the whole serendipitous approach that she had when she told me about the shot she said that she and the stylist were, um, were were quite interested in doing a shot of just the cream dripping onto the plate but they spilt some on the table so they thought well let's let's just flood the whole table and it turned out to, to be like such a great shot and and the book Bought, Borrowed, and Stolen was shot by Andrew Montgomery. That's not a food photographer, but he took almost like a paparazzi type of approach. You know, I, and I often find um, really spectacular images in in really strange ways. Um, there's there's a there's a New York gallerist that I was talking to, and 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 she was giving me nominations for the PDN's 30 and she put this person up for nomination and um, he's a NASA astronaut named Donald Petit and he has a Flickr page and he's you know he's he's an astronaut just really into photography and he's been doing like the most the most amazing long exposure work I, I mean it completely blew my mind and and, and of course like it's all based on, on the access that he has. So when I contacted him, asking him if it was okay that I use his image in my slideshow, he was like over the moon about it. Sorry for the pun, but <laughs> but he, he he was just um, he was so selfless about it, feeling that um, he has a job where he's seeing things that no one else sees, and he was saying yes, show my work, go to my Flickr page, use whatever you like, and um, that I found quite fun. Um, you know, the other thing that, that, that I've seen with, within the context of the photo industry is like major, major changes in technology. Um, you know, the, the one aspect that, that, that I've seen the most of is like how, how photographers are doing self-promotion. And, and there are some really ingenious things that have happened where um, like in 2010, advertising photographer Monty Isom um, basically made an app. And, but, but it's kind of a fun app and it's a really useful app where, where um, whoever downloads it could, could get restaurant tips, could get you know, recommendations for hotels. They can play little games of like finding Monty Isom and you know, his clients are using it all the time because they want to know where in the world he is so that they could possibly shoot things for him. So it's a, so it's a, so it's a promo that gets a lot of attraction in, in a lot of different ways. And as you've probably seen, a lot of photographers are using the iPad as a portfolio. I mean, a few years ago, um, we would be calling in books at PDN, but, but, but now photographers, they would bring an iPad. Um, and it's a good piece of technology, but it's not for everyone. There, there are certain types of work that, that just don't come through in this technology. Like I think it's fine for, for like an editorial shooter, for like an advertiser shooter. Like if you're a fine artist, like it's good for um, a portfolio to just kind of get the message across. But, but of course you, you really can't see the quality of the prints. Which, which is very important from a fine art point of view. And you know the other um, part of technology that, that our magazine has been covering a lot, which I find quite fascinating, is motion. There are a lot of still photographers that have been transitioning into motion, and you know it's just you know it's just a piece of technology. There there was. Um, there are still a lot of people that have kind of a purist view that don't view as photography, but 
you know, I, I think it's, it's like it is tied in because it's a form of communication. Um, you know, I'd like to also talk about how, like if you look at the history of photography, photography has always been inextricably linked to technology. You know, like printing processes. You, you look at the history of photography, there's, there, there's different moments where different printing processes were in vogue and ha had, had photographers going crazy over it. And, you know, like, you, like a few years ago, it seemed like with, with shows and, and um, portfolio events, we would see really big prints. Everyone was printing big prints. And, and a big part of it was because of technology. It kind of allowed them to print big. So the latest piece of technology that I'm really excited about is these 3D printers. And I'm not sure what artists are going to do with it, but it's like it's quite exciting where um, what you do is, right now the technology is set that, that you take a CAD file, you feed it into the printer, and it prints um, like a 3D object. And I think the technology will soon arise where you, you would be able to put a photograph in and somehow tweak it so you can print from it. And you know, I, you know, I just have faith that um, the photographers and artists will make good use of this technology. But as um, you know, I've always found you know technology like cameras and printers and lenses to to be like quite alluring, and you know kind of sexy in a way. Like if you've ever like if you've you know if you've ever been to um, PDN's photo expo, you know it's like being a kid in a candy store. You just walk by booth after booth, you know, of lenses of really cool high-end equipment. But, you know, as sexy as that is, for me what's important is the photography and how, you know, it is and it should be about the image. And there, there are certain projects out there that, that just really move me. And, and among those projects is um, the Interrogations Project by Don Weber. You know, I just love it from a formal point point of view, where it's just simple. It's just such a simple concept. You know, you have someone being interrogated in Russia, but but you don't ever see the the interrogator, and and it's a simple background with all of the images, but there's so much there's there's like so much emotion that comes across in an image like that, and it's it's a. Um, um, each image, you see the expressions in the face, and you know, of course, there's a captioning there, but you you actually don't even have to see the captioning to um, feel the fear, to feel um, like a certain amount of com a certain amount of compassion towards the people being interrogated. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, um, why photos really tend to move me. It's um, like, for instance, th this is a photo. This is a photo by Amy Vitale, and that that I think just works as a photo in so many different ways. And you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, why is it that I love this image so so much? And you know, it's basically a well, it was a shot taken from 2004 of Kashmiri villagers that that are mourning. But an image like this, you, you look at the expressions, it, um, there's so much of the story that really comes across without ever needing a caption. And with, with photography, it is a visual language. And there have been so many times when I've met with photographers, looked at projects, and they're t telling me about the story of the shoot and what they're shooting. And, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like such an amazing thing to photograph. But then you look at the photographs, and if the photographs don't stand up with that visual language, then then it's not a good project. And you know, unfortunately, you know, unless the the, the photography is of a certain quality, then the, the then the project is quite weak. And even with with Amy's you know travel shot, and she shoots a lot for National Geographic. There's, you know, th th this is a public bath that's that's in Budapest, which which you don't even have to you know know that much about, you know, 
where it's shot or why it's shot, but, but there's so much of the environment that, she, that she's captured. I mean, it creates a narrative. There, there's a photojournalist that's, in, um, that, that's worked with CBS in Los Angeles, and his name is Les Rose. And about 10 years ago, I had the pleasure to hear him speak at the NPPA conference that was held in Chicago. And what, what Les Rose is most known for is there, there, was a, there are these little news segments that, that are called, that are basically called Every, Everybody Has a Story. And um, um, the way these segments start is um, they get some person from the previous segment, he takes a dart, he throws it behind his back to, to a map, and, and, and then they examine where the dart has landed. So where the, where the dart has landed is going to be the location of their next segment. So they go to that place, they find a phone booth, and, and they randomly choose a name from, from the local phone booth. And the, the whole inspiring thing about it is um, Les Rose felt that, uh, that everyone has a story and that if you find a person and if you, ask the, if you ask the right questions, if you dig deep enough, there's something worth photographing, something worth documenting. You know, I'm a big fan of editing because it's, it's our first contact with a person's project. And there are so many different ways of actually telling a story that it's, it's um, you know, often, um, you know, I see gigantic works in progress and, and I think that everything's kind of on the right track, but then you see, see the final editing or you see how it's used in, 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 like, a, in like a magazine and you, and you just kind of feel that um, the good parts of that project was, was, was not re really utilized. So I think that, you know, it's like, like it's quite important to know exactly what you want from a project. Which, which kind of made me think about the work of Mario Tama. Um, he's, he's a photojournalist based here in New York, and he's been <coughs> covering New Orleans uh, since Hurricane Katrina. Like, he was there when the hurricane hit. And he's been, you know, going back time and time again. And um, he's, you know, I just talked to him th this afternoon about the shot, and he said that since, um, since the hurricane, he's, he's been down to New Orleans more than 20 times. But it took him that many times to go there to know how he wanted to shape his project. And he, he was very interested in, in, in knowing like why people were, were moving back there. So he, he, he was you know, quite conscious about wanting to document like the families and, and the parades and the, uh, the sense of friendship that, that people had and, and like a certain amount of pride. But it's you know, I just kind of think about you know, times when, when I meet people and they say they have a project that's done, but you find out that they've only, they've, they've only worked on it for a few months. And, you know, there are some photographers that are able to crank out like a solid project in that amount of time, but, that, but, but I think that those, those are very rare projects. So since... Um, you know, also since since I've been working, uh, you know, since I've been working at Photo District News, which, um, like like a few years after I started, was when 9/11 happened, and since 9/11, there's been a tremendous amount of war photography out there, and you know, I am a big fan of photojournalism, of, of of photojournalism and war photography, and there have been some really excellent examples of of work that have that have come out. One of the photographers that immediately comes to mind is, is Louis Palu, who, who, who shot these portraits of U.S. soldiers um, that, were, that were in Afghanistan. And um, what gives these images so much power for me is, is that it, when, when I first saw these images, like it, these images immediately made me think of Don McCullen's iconic shot of the shell shock soldier from 1968. So here we have a fin here we have a series of photographs that, that were taken, you know, 
four decades later from Don the Cullen shot. But, but that parallel r really kind of gave it a, um, like a lot more oomph in a sense. Because you had Don McCullen's work was Vietnam, Louis Palu's work is, is Afghanistan, uh, you know, two parallel photos, two parallel wars. You know, the other war photographer that, that has excited me quite a lot is um, the work by Benjamin Lowy. And, you know, like for instance, if you look at this image, it's a street scene. Of, uh, of these, you know, street scene of Iraqis, they're kind of hanging out. It's, it's like an everyday shot, which, uh, you know, if you look at magazines that show, you know, shots from, from war zones, there's a lot of these types of shots that give a sense of place. But what Benjamin Lowy has done is, um, you know, he's kind of pulled back his camera a bit to kind of show the viewer like a bit more of where the shot came from. Because most embedded photographers, you know, spend a lot of time, you know, stuck, st stuck in these, um, these armored vehicles. So there's this real separation between what they're photographing and what, what this basically, what he's basically done is he's turned the content around because first you're looking at the street scene, but then when, when you see the window of the armored vehicle, you start to think about what the predicament is of the photographer. So it's about him now. And the, the, the graphic element of this project is quite strong. And both Deborah and I exhibited this work a couple of times. We were quite thrilled with it. And the other, um, the other thing that, that thrills me about Ben Lowy is, you know, he's not, you know, he's not afraid to, you know, um, do things like use new technologies. In his, in, you, you know, in a recent project, which is called I Libya, um, he's, he, you know, he's basically shoot, shooting these shots on, um, they're they're shot on iPhones, and one of the reasons was quite practical because when you shoot with an iPhone, you don't have to carry around big bags. And during the revolution in Libya, it was so chaotic that 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 you didn't want to stand out as a photographer. And but but another um, but like another influence that played into it was was he really wanted to um, like he really wanted to make use of social media because because when he took these shots he would be able to upload them onto his blog and and get like instant traction on these images. Um, so in 2007, we launched a gallery, and when, when I say we, I mean my lovely wife that's there in the crowd. <laughs> the main inspiration of <coughs> launching Klomchen Gallery was, was the fact that Deborah and I are very, very passionate about photography, and you know, it was an opportunity to to get close to the work, to work with artists, to to have a space that we can curate with, you know. But but most importantly, to you know sell artworks and and to be in a position to deal with collectors. And you know, so each year we so each year we we have approximately six shows, and we've. Uh, we have a roster of photographers that have slowly grown, and the 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 huge difference between working with a working with the magazine and working with a gallery, you know, is how we view the images. Because like when 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 I'm at PDN, you know, I'm looking at the image, I'm looking at the content, I'm thinking about the story, I'm trying to figure out what kind of hook it has for the photography industry but but in the gallery the 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 content is quite important but but the photo also becomes the object so it's basically um, just the two of us working in the gallery 
we have a really complementary skill set to, you know, Cellworks and and next week's going to be our, you know, fifth anniversary, which we're absolutely thrilled thrilled about, and 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 it's been a really really interesting ride because it's you know as you know when we launched the art gallery the economy was not great but we've found a way to make it happen and we're very proud of the photography that that we're able to show one of the photographers that we have in our roster is Philip Toledano and when Deborah and I first saw a new kind of beauty it it absolutely you know it absolutely blew our mind you know and Phil is very um, He's also very successful in the editorial realm, but what impressed us about Phil's work is just just the sheer craftsmanship of his images. And um, yeah, the other thing about his work too is, um, you know, in terms of our shows, it was among the most among the most challenging shows that that we've had. There were people that loved it. There were people that were repulsed by it, but but it created a, but it created a really interesting dialogue. Jim Naughton is another photographer that we we represent, and um, we we have his second show coming up next year. And um, you know the thing I'd like to talk about since we're on Jim's work. Well, first, some th this is Jim's project called Reenactors, and they're you know war reenactors from from England. And actually, the funny thing is, when we had the show, there were some German tourists that came into the gallery, and they were really upset that we were we had a picture of a Nazi hanging on the wall. But we had to explain that it was just a costume, and that the person was English, and and it's not real. But um, there, there's within the context of the gallery, it's you know it's a really it's very much of a symbiotic relationship between the artists and the art gallery. We, we really need each other, and, but then there are mutual responsibilities. I mean, it's a lot like a marriage, and, and it is like a business partnership. And um, you know, part of what we look for, you know, aside from photographers creating great work, we're looking for photographers that are able to fulfill certain responsibilities. Like for instance, if a client comes in and and he wants to purchase a print, but if we can't find the photographer to do the print, then then it's prob then it's quite problematic. You know, another of our photographers that 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 I've quite liked. Well, you know, actually, I you know I love our entire roster, but. But um, you know, I like to talk about Tessa Bunny's work and and her project of you know peasants from the Carpathian Mountains. You know, it's a project called Hand to Mouth, and so we work very closely with our photographers, like in terms of advising them on on questions of editioning or or, or sizes, and help to make selections of of which images we want our clients to see. And and with with Tessa's body of work, which was quite broad, what Deborah and I decided to do was choose, choose a lot of the images with hands, because we, we found that, that there was something about the peasants that, that, that toiled on the land. There was, an expressive, there, there was an expressiveness to their hands that we found quite fascinating. Max de Esteban is a photographer that we've We've recently exhibited, or actually it was last year, and and he's he's based in Barcelona, and what what we really liked about this work is um, just just kind of like the interplay between low technology and high technology. Um, so basically, what what he does is he's taken these um, pieces of old technology that used to be high technology, and and they're all like objects that were used to disseminate artistic information. And he'd completely deconstruct them, and he'd photograph each layer after painting them white, and then he'd sandwich the image. And what's fascinating about it is kind of its reference towards certain aspects of, of art and photographic history. The, the bluish tint um, references the cyanotype. 
and it is kind of like a blueprint in the sense that you're seeing the mechanism. So a bit earlier when I started talking about clump chain, I started to talk about like how, you know, a lot, a lot of it deals with um, the image as the object. And, um, you know, a big part of what Deborah and I do is we, you know, curate in our space or we curate in different spaces. And, and, and this, um, this is a layout of the exhibit that Deborah and I curated. It's, it's a show called The Architecture Space, and we did it for the inaugural Flash Forward Festival back in 2010. And we're, we're constantly aware of things like sight lines, which groups of, which groups of work are next to each other, um, exactly where the door is, where the restroom is. We're, we're thinking about wh where, where the flow of people go. And because because we're interested in having the the show read in a certain way, like there there's a big difference between you know photo editing for a magazine and and curating a space. Like when you photo ed, when you photo edit for a magazine or a website, you're you're working from point A to point B, first page, second page, third page. With with a three dimensional space, you're you're really working with with, with like the entire space and and trying to second guess what people's tendencies are going to be. Like if, it's, like if it's near a certain type of door, you might have someone you know, lingering there for a, certain, for a certain amount of time. So we want to try to read the space. And when we curate a show, try to have the show read in a certain way. You know, for us, it's really important for uh, for our photographers, and I, I guess photographers, it just just all photographers to to really take a close look at themselves and 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 like figure out what their context is, like like look at art history, what is their place, who they are, what they do, and and to be aware of you know similar projects that are done in the same vein. Because, it, I mean, when it gets down to it, a lot of our clients are quite cultured and educated, so they're, you know, they're able to read the images, and, and a lot of them are aware of art history and photo history. And, you know, I think once a photographer does that, then, then, then it kind of can, can open up more possibilities where, where you kind of have a sense of um, which, which types of spaces you might be able to exhibit in if, if you're that kind of photographer. I mean, there's, there's nonprofit spaces and there's commercial galleries, and they show very different types of work. When we have an exhibit, um, one of our considerations, I mean, aside from you know, thinking the work is fantastic and really wanting to show it, we also have to think about boring, mundane things like rent. You know, we're expecting the show to help us pay rent. Whereas if you're exhibiting in a nonprofit space, the, the nonprofit galleries don't necessarily have to worry about those aspects, and they don't have to worry about, you know, um, selling work. But they have different concerns. So, um, you know, you know, another thing I, you know, I'd like to say about, you know, having an understanding about. Um, who you are as a photographer, what, what we like to do is, is really try to figure out who, who the photographer is and who the photographer is and, and what they do now and what they're going to do. Because when, when we sign up a photographer, we're interested in um, working with them on the long term. And we're, we're interested in the project we're interested in. But we want to know that there's a second project and a third project that that has that same amount of quality because there were some collectors out there that once they get glued on to a certain photographer they they like to you know collect different bodies of work from that person um, you know a bit earlier in the talk I started to talk about storytelling and um, you know storytelling <coughs> is you know also quite important with within within the fine art realm, but but stories are told in in kind of a different way. You know, I think that a lot of images tends tends to create its own type of narrative, but with 
with fine artwork. It's more of like a contemplation that, that you feel when you look at works. Whereas if you're looking through a magazine at an editorial piece, editorial pieces need to get the message across really quickly. And it has to do with the, the, the viewer relationship. Like if you're printed in a magazine, your, your image is going to be seen for maybe two seconds. They'll open the spread, the message is conveyed, and then you turn the page. Whereas in, with, with fine artwork, um, collectors that buy things, they, they want to buy something that they could you know, look at over and over again and get a different type of message from it whenever they look at it. Oh, and this, this is work by Brad Moore. It's a um, Southern California-based photographer. There are lots of people that ask us like, how we find photographers. So I kind of made like a list of like a few of the ways that we do find photographers. And, and it really varies. It's, it's like we, we go to a lot of photo festivals, we go to thesis shows, um, um, we, we get a lot of referrals from people. There are um, promos stuffed under our door. There's, you know, you meet people standing in line and you, you um, strike up a good conversation. But we look through books, magazines, exhibit catalogs. And, um, you know, there, so there's lots of ways to get your work out there and to actually be found. But, 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 but you kind of have to, you know, do things thoughtfully. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that, like, it takes us, like, it really takes us a long time to, well, it normally takes us a long time to sign a photographer. Like, if we see the work that we like, we'll, you know, slowly get to know the person, we'll, we'll um, look at their website, we'll follow their, um, their exhibit history. Because it's when when you when we sign someone, it is a business partnership, and we just want to make sure that it's a that it's a wise choice. So, so one of the methods that's become really really popular with photographers is going to portfolio events, and and Deborah and I tend to go to, tend to go to a lot of them, and and it's it's a you know it's a good way for photographers to meet people in the industry that they wouldn't normally have access to. And, and there's, there's basically like three reasons why you should be going. You either go for feedback, you go for advice, or you go to make a pitch. And uh, what, what I mean by that is you, when, when you have a finished project that's airtight, th then you go to pitch it. You pitch it to like your publisher, or you, you pitch it to the galleries. You know, if you have a work in progress and you're not too happy about it and, and you want to learn from people, then you go for advice. You know, if you're not sure what, um, like if you have a solid project and you want to get people's reaction from it, then, then you go for feedback. And, and, and there, there are like a lot of different events out there, but you have to choose them wisely. Like, like you just can't assume that if you go to like a big portfolio event, that it's that it's the wisest choice. You have to look at the roster of who's there, and see if there's anyone of use. There, there's a lot of people that have um, that that have said it's like speed dating, because basically you sit down and you only have 20 minutes to you know talk with um, the ind the industry professional that's there, and and I've also heard it referred to as a meat market because it is a bit like that, but but I think it's um, but I think it's a bit shorter than speed dating. I you know I think it's more like a flirtation because 20 minutes you really can't get that much information through. What you can do is you can do your best, but within that 20 minutes, um, it's uh, the photographer and and the gallerist checking each other out to like see if they want to take things a step further and see more work. And, and it's always good to be um, slightly prepped and, and knowing how to talk about your work because we're interested in knowing that, that, that you're passionate about your work and you know how to talk about your work. And when, when Deborah and I go to these events, we often come back with a humongous bag of self-promos. Um, this is a pile from, from 
from one week at Houston Photo Fest, but, but this has been cut down. And there's, you know, I think that self-promotion is important, but, you know, I think it's what, what you have to think about is um, doing things quite wisely, because there's, there's never a shortage of ways to spend money doing self-promos. I mean, I've gone to events where, you know, I get a CD, I, I get a blurb book, I get, you know, things that are really expensive, and I don't know why I'm getting these things if, if I'm not even interested in the photographer. And it makes me feel kind of bad because these events are quite expensive. And when it gets down to it, um, you know, I'm really interested in seeing the photos. So I, I think good, good promos can help, but, but, but a good promotional strategy will, will never, it, it'll never gloss over work that's um, not of good quality. Um, this is something that, that both Deborah and I tend to encounter a lot. Like a lot of photographers at these events, since they only have 20 minutes, the first thing out of their mouth is that they're interested in gallery representation, they want a solo exhibit, they, they have to have a book deal. And the interesting thing that I find is, is um, you know, like about a decade ago, um, you know, photographers that got all three of these things, um, they, they, they got these be, because they were successful, but, but these days it's, it's kind of backwards where some photographers feel that um, the, these are boxes to be checked in order to become successful. Like, like I've had um, um, photographers approach us saying, oh, we, we really, you know, um, I think it's time for a show in your gallery because I have a book. I have a book. You have to look at my book. But, you know, I'm, it's, you know, unless um, Deborah and I love the work, we, we don't, you know, we don't show the work. And, and it does take a lot of patience. Because, I mean, doing something right does take a lot of time. Um, you know, I think about Lisa Robinson. Um, she, um, you know, she, she's exhibited with us a couple of times. She has, she has a wonderful book that was published by Kerr Verleg called Snowbound. And from, from inception of the project to publishing a book, it was basically a five-year journey. And, you know, she, she, she spent, like, years photographing snow. And, but, but also working on the book project, um, she, she basically took about a year off to work on the book and, and she, she took care of like a lot of the, the public relations on it because it's, it's hard to expect a book publisher to, to really take care of everything. I mean, they, they really do the best they can, but um, most book publishers have, have a number of books that they're pushing. And, and Lisa's second body of work, Oceana, was um, was exhibited at our, at, at our gallery and was actually um, you know something we really love about the work too is both of the projects are connected to each other. So so since I'm kind of a um, since I'm kind of an email hog, I you know like I, I I didn't really get a chance to empty my email box, so it made me quite easy to to count the amount of promos I had. So I made this little chart of like the different methods that that I got self promos, and you know I was quite surprised that that I only got 76 invites through Facebook, but the majority of it is emailed, and you know I just like to kind of express how um, most people's email boxes tend to get really jam packed and and full and non functioning after like a few emails of, you know, 10 megabyte files attached to it. So, you know, I always tell photographers that are interested in communicating with us to, um, you know, send us emails, but, but, but make sure if you send an email that, that, it's, that, that it's something that, that is worth reading. Because, you know, if you constantly send emails that's like the picture of the day or the picture of the week, or, um, or the one that tends to end up in our mailboxes is, um, is an email with images attached and the message is, hi, thought you might like to see these. 
but but those those normally end up in the trash. And th there's there's a few times that that that, that we do get unsolicited drop-offs, but but that's but that's normally not advised. And like it, it normally happens when we're in the gallery, we're really busy trying to do work because we're we're there in the gallery working. We're not really just sitting around. We we love talking to clients. We love talking to people that are really interested in the work because that's why we're there. We we talk about the work, but we also have a lot of um, other work that we have to deal with. And and normally an unsolicited drop off just kind of rubs us the wrong way. And or it's we get unsolicited drop offs from from painters and sculptors that that don't even know that we're strictly a photography gallery. So but but I basically also want to say that that. That like any business, what you have to do is um, just just kind of view um, <clears throat> view it strategically. Like if you approach a gallery, or if you want a book and approach a publisher, know who you're approaching, and 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 know what what kind of work they might be interested in. So our first show was was Simon Roberts' Motherland, where he sent about he spent about a year traveling through Russia, and and Deborah and I had met him like a few years earlier at a portfolio event in England. And what we absolutely love about Simon is, is like the focus he has on his projects. You know, so after um, being in Russia, he, he decided to turn his lens in England where, where he lives. And w with his We English project, it, it, w it was absolutely, the, well the thing that I find absolutely fantastic and brilliant is um, um, the the creativity he had in terms of, of, of marketing this project. Well, I mean, first of all, he's, he's an immensely talented photographer, but what he did with We English was he had started a blog, you know, right when he started the project, and, and, and he was soliciting suggestions of, like, where he should shoot. And he got thousands of followers who were making all these suggestions, and so he, he went out and shot a lot of their suggestions. So what ended up happening was when he finally got his book published by Chris Boot, he had an instant audience. And, 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 that, and that was a brilliant way to create traction for his project, you know, even prior to really starting it. Oh, and also with, um, I can't remember if it was, I, I think it was The Independent or maybe The Telegraph. Um, he had a, um, you know, he had arranged to, you know, like um, use some of his outtakes and some of his, some of his additional images as, as as like a column, but but he was really careful not to use like the same types of images that he wanted to push as his fine artwork, and he's also you know <coughs> documented the um, the election the elections in Britain, and he started his own blog with it, and but but his latest project is a project called Pyridum, where he's um, he's set out to document all the remaining um, British pleasure piers. And they're like fantastic pieces of architecture, and there's so much history instilled in them. And what the, the connecting, um, one of the co connecting elements I see in Simon's work, which, which, which I find it's brilliant, is, is he has, because he's taking um, kind of a device that was used by a lot of European landscape painters where where he's photographing from from a higher perspective so, so you see the distance a lot more and you you find that in his peers work you, you find it in his we English work and um, you know you know aside from creating terrific work what what Simon has done right and you know he's a photographer that Primarily makes his living off of print sales, which, which is really tough to do in this market. And what he has done is he's found that real balance between, you know, creating work, but 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 also being in control of his brand and and networking. And you kind of have to do all of those things in order to make it work. Like he has. You know, of course, his Facebook and his Twitter and and various other websites, but but he's in control of like which images are out there and how they all come back to his website, and um, you what what you want is what you want is the um, the you want to be in charge of the uh, 
uh, the technology and not the technology in charge of you. It's, so as you can imagine, there, there's really like a million photographers out there and, and, um, and part of what you want to, you know, I'm sure that part of what a lot of people want to know is what can one do to really stand out? And, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's when we look at work, we, 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 we look at like lots of different aspects of it and, and you know, try to figure out, you know, first if it's a body of work that, that we really believe in and it's fantastic and we want to see if it's, um, you know, if it's a fit with us. And for, for, for us, it's, it's um, you, you know, I come back to, to the object where um, we're very attracted to just like things as simple as like the quality of paper with, with Ken Rosenthal's work. Um, when, when you see it in a projection, it, it doesn't do justice to like what the actual prints look like. And when our clients come to the gallery, they look at actual prints. And Wojtesz Slama, a Czech photographer that we also rep represent, works in silver bromide. And, and his work, they're, they're quirky snapshots of his friends and his life in Czech Republic. And he's so old school in the sense that when he sent us the work, he even had a wax seal on it. But, but the object within fine art is really, really important. And um, so I got to say that, that um, it, it helps us to know as much about a body of work in order to talk to our clients. And we're, we're often like really interested in knowing like what photographers' inspirations are. Like Mark Barrett, who we exhibited a couple of times in group shows at our gallery with, with his constructed landscapes, were, was, was, was highly influenced by the landscape paintings of Peter Paul Rubens. And um, one of our artists, Odette England, that um, with, with, her with her project dealing with the fragility of memory w was inspired um, formalistically by the Ishihara colorblind test. Then we have Anthony Crossfield that's, that comes from uh, like a background where he was very influenced by painting and was completely in influenced by the paintings of Francis Bacon. So, um, so I'd like to take this time to like talk a, a bit about my inspirations. I mean, aside from looking at work, talking to people, life in general, th there's just like so much stuff out there. There, there's there's a Nielsen blog tracker that that as of last week, they they've listed 180 million blogs. Like, I'm not sure how how they came up with that count, but um, what, what's important is like knowing who you are and what your tastes are. I mean, it's definitely import, important for us because our collectors come to us just for taste. You, you know, there's a lot of trust involved there. So it's, um, so I always find it kind of important to, you know, you know, kind of important to, you know, be, be kind of like a self aggregator because because you have to aggregate all of the stuff out there and figure out what you want to look at because you certainly can't look at it all. So, um, so our latest obsession is a wonderful British photographer. His name is John Blakemore, and he's 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 going to be our next show. And and he's you know he's viewed as a British national treasure. His his entire um, archive was was recently purchased. For, for the British, which, which is quite an honor. And what I love about John's work is, is it's, you know, it's, it, you know, it's imagery that could be re read on different levels, but, but, it, but it is really like a, um, it's, it's, it's a celebration of beauty. And his silver gelatin prints, they're all printed by him. And, um, you know, he's an example of a person that, that that was that you know that that was so obsessed with quality that like for instance like his tulips he, he spent eight years photographing tulips and and a lot of that comes from his instincts as a photographer of, of, of just needing to work that amount of time to get it right so I think that patience is a virtue 
and um, his you know his work is um, there. You know everything. Well, well, the thing that's really special for us too with John's work is every one of his prints w was printed by his by his hands, and and he's viewed as a master printer. I mean, he's able to get like the, the most the most amazing you know feelings from from imagery, and everything's in darkroom. And um, you know, I do hope that um, that like through my rambles and bits and bobs of information that that I um, gave something of use and something of entertainment, and that's a bit of who I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You were basically talking about you had that whole screen with blogs or websites that you visit. Uh -huh. So which are the favorites, the first thing in the morning when you wake up or when you go to your computer? Mm -hmm. So which are the first few sites that you go and hit? Oh, God, this is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> and it does, yeah. Yeah, every single morning I go to The Guardian and I go to The Sun and they kind of balance each other out. One is for news, one is for entertainment. and but. But, you know, I do like, you know, um, see, I find myself going to blogs for different reasons. Sometimes it's entertainment. Sometimes I want to, you know, find some information, you know, in works. I mean, I love um, going to Bidwell Projects because he's, he's a collector. And, and I'm very interested in, you know, what, what collectors think and what collectors collect. And, you know, I love the Selby, which, which, which is a... Which is a blog started by, by Todd Selby. And, and it's just kind of fun interior shots of good looking people, creative people. And you know, I just find it a joy. And it's the same thing with the sartorialists. You know, just street fashion, I like that. You, you know, and of course I go to all, all of PDN's blogs, like you know, PDN Pulse, which is a very good blog because it gives you like a lot of industry gossip and, and useful information like, which photo editor has gone to which magazine, or how, how certain lawsuits are doing, and there's been a lot of suing lately, <laughs> and so, but 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 it kind of depends on my mood, you know. You know, I love thing, things like lens culture and flak photo, you know. Thanks. Sure. But but if you ask me that, like <coughs> like in five minutes, I'm going to give you a totally different answer, <laughs> you know. I, I mean, there, you know, like a lot of, a lot of times it's quite serendipitous, yes. you know. I mean, I, I look at blogs for research and, and, and also for entertainment. Yeah. Come on, someone must have a question. I'm interested to hear a little more about um, the relationship between you and the collector. Mm -hmm. And um, you were talking about trust and I don't know what my specific question is, but maybe you could offer a story or something about what, wh why you find that so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Well, essentially both um, what both Deborah and I love is we, we love talking about the photography that, that we represent, the photography that we, we sell. And you know, I can't create like a generalization about who the collector is because there are like so many different types of collectors but but there is very much there is very much of an element of trust be, because when it gets down to it and um, like like it might not this this might be oversimplifying it but but you know art galleries basically is a luxury market so you have um, things that are very expensive um, you know changing hands so so if there's a collector that comes in and and if they're you know buying something that's an addition of five, um, they they really have to be assured that that it's an addition of five, because 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 we would like it would totally freak them out if they they bought this image and then ten years down the line there's like ten more images that are appearing at au auction and and there goes their investment, you know. 
and but 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 also in terms of trust too. It's it's um, when when Deborah and I started the gallery, um, we were like a lot of our clients were, were quite new because we were a new gallery. But but a lot of our um, but we've been in the business for long enough that we've started to have some repeat clients, and and they're starting to trust our taste, and we're starting to understand their taste, and and sometimes they'll call us and they want some advice, and and so we, as much as possible, try to give them as much as advice, to to help them grow their collection. Does does, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I or? Just, I, to me, it seemed like there was this kind of like matchmaker romance to <laughs> being in a gallery and having clients and developing relationships with them, with collectors. So I was wondering if. if well, I'm not if sure if I would true. use the term matchmaker, but but you know I do find that you know. Um, you know, if someone buys something from us, we, we really want to make sure that that they're um, buying something that they want, because uh, we absolutely don't want a situation where someone's unhappy. You know, so so we try to talk to them and read them and and make sure they understand what they're buying. And uh, so I guess it is kind of matchmaker. We're we're trying to match them up with the perfect piece of art. Hi, um, I just wanted to, I, I guess in just thinking about like the formation of the gallery, um, I was kind of thinking about maybe if you could, if you have any story of perhaps like your greatest mistake that became a learning experience, like, or, you know, something that turned around, like that you made a bad judgment on that really helped you form, you know, the gallery in a better way. You know, I have to say that. The, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I can't think of any like major, major mistakes. We we've actually we, we've actually been quite lucky in that respect. So, but but it's always been a learning experience. I mean, when when we hung um, our first show, which was Motherland by Simon Roberts, we thought those pieces were really big, and, and Deborah and I were using all four of our hands to hang it, and we we're being so careful. But since we've had subsequent shows with like really big pieces, you know, now when I rehang a piece of Simon's, I'm hanging it with one hand. <laughs> and but you know, we've we you know, like any business, we've we've made certain mistakes, but but like learn from them. And and but but luckily we haven't made any you know major mistakes. Like we haven't been sued. We haven't you know had had images with museum glass fall face down, you know. But so so I know that's that's probably a boring answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Understanding that of course you have to, as you said, keep the doors open. You must have work that will sell but not compromise your standards. Um, sometimes when you are reviewing work do you see things and go, hmm, that will sell, but I don't want it, but I don't know if I really want it in my gallery? Or do you see something and say, hmm, such and such a client, or I have two or three clients who I think would want this when you're reviewing work? Does all of that sort of roll through your head? You know, there are, um, you know, it's like work that I look at that I don't like. You know, I don't even think about you know if it's going to sell or not. You know, it's it's like it hasn't even like gone into the, to the equation. It's 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 normally when when there's some work that I'm looking at that I'm totally enthused by, then I start to think of you know what's what's the probability of this this work being a success or not. But you know, I mean, both both Deborah and I have no interest in you know carrying works that we're not passionate about because it's a and it's a small gallery. It's, it's it's a small roster we have, and we have to be able to stand behind everything that we carry. But but you know there there are you know projects that I love to death that that I know that we can't sell, and, and it breaks my heart that that like I can't carry it. Yeah, there, and you know, but 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 there are niches of people that collect certain types of things. But 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 we carry work that we like, but we always 
have to have a business hat on because because it is you know it is capitalism supply demand it's it's a business you know and we have to treat it as such I'll ask um, an extension of that question. Is um, working in Brooklyn, being based in Brooklyn, its own kind of thing in terms of um, audience expectations and the content you provide, the, the price point of work, or is it just uh, similar to having a gallery in Manhattan? Well, you know, I have to say, you know, having our gallery based in Brooklyn has been a real joy. You know, you know, it's it's, it's a fantastic space we have. We, we love the Dumbo area. I mean, architecturally, it's fantastic. You know, we, we get to see the New York skyline every night. But, um, but in terms of, you know, pricing, you know, th things are priced how things are priced with, within the art market. Because like a lot of our clients, they're, um, we have clients in Brooklyn, we have clients in Manhattan, we have clients that are in Europe. So, so we charge... So we price things w within the realm of um, what's standard in the art world. So at, at that, in that sense, it's, um, it's an extension of the art scene in Manhattan, pretty much? Well, it's, you know, I know that the people in Brooklyn would, would, would hate one saying that, that the Brooklyn art world is an extension of Manhattan, they, they'll probably think that, that it's the opposite. But, you know, I just think that there are, um, the, the thing, the, the thing that I love about you know um, Manhattan and New York City is, is it's a conglomeration of different villages, you know, and they they all coexist. Come on, one more question. Yep. Do I use that? Okay. <laughs> How much experience do you like take? to be a trusting artist to, like, how much experience do you expect them to have before they pitch an idea? Well, you know, it kind of de depends on who it is and, and, like, how solid of a project that they have, you know? Be because, like, you know, I remember, um, God, when was it? It was years ago. I, um, I went to a portfolio event that was in Santa Fe, and Alex Soth was there shopping around his project, and he was just this young buck, you know, with this great project. And, but it was such an airtight project, and the work was so brilliant that, that things happened for him very, very quickly. Like, like with, with us, um, we'll look at a photographer, we'll look at their work, and then we'll follow them for a while. We'll, we'll totally check them out, where we'll um, look at their exhibit history, we'll, we'll, we'll um, talk to people that, that, that had worked with them or get some people's advice. We'll even, and, and I don't want to sound like a stalker or anything, but, but, but we even look at their Facebook pages and their tweets. Because it's important for us to, to know like, what kind of public branding they have. Be, and, but the reason why we do that is because a lot of our clients, or um, some of our clients, you know, if they're interested in really heavily investing in an artist, they want to make sure it's a good investment on their part so they're, they'll do their own research. Because you live in a... Um, day and age where, you know, all the information's at your fingertips. Like, all you need is the name of a photographer, and you do a Google, and then you look up exhibit history, you look up, you know, what they've been doing. And we, you know, basically want to get the sense that this, um, whoever we, you know, sign on for an, ex an exhibit is going to take a very professional approach. Because exhibits are planned quite far in advance, and and there's not a lot of um, leeway for any flakiness. Like if you schedule in a show and then the person feels like, no, I don't want to exhibit, you know, it's, you know, so, you know, I know it's, it's, it's not a very concrete answer, mm -hmm. but, but it kind of varies from person to person, you know. You seem to be very careful in how you select your artists. Has there been some experiences where in taking the time that you do and checking them out that you just kind of lose them to other galleries and folks like that? And um, 
You know, there, there, there have been like some situations where we see like a photographer at an event and, you know, Deborah and I are thinking, yeah, that, that person would be such a good fit, you know, and then we, we take our time following them and then they're snapped up by someone else. And so that has happened, you know, but, but, but that comes with, you know, as a, you know, as a process, um, Deborah and I take the amount of time that, that we take. And, and that happens with all galleries. Yeah, I just have one more question. Has there been anybody who you've shown who maybe hasn't sold a thing, whose work you loved, who's stayed on at your gallery? Do you just let people like that go? Or what's your experience with that like? like well, it's like all the people that we have on our roster are, you know, they're photographers whose work we, we have like a ton of faith in. And, you know, like, you know, like any other business that has that works with a roster, you know, there are certain photographers that, that do better than others. But, um, you know, the, you know, we haven't dropped a photographer. We, we, we love our roster. You, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why we take so long to sign people is we want to make sure that we like them as people because it is a close working relationship. And, you know, it just takes us time to figure out if we like them. Cause, I mean, there are some art gal there. There are some art galleries that 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 operate more like um, big extended flat files, where they'll they'll have rosters of 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 like you know sixty or seventy, you know, photographers, which, which is a certain type of business model, where it's some some place where photographers sell their work. But with us, and the way that we like to work, we like to work really closely with the photographers and and give them advice on. Where where we think their project is going, and 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 they ask us for advice. You you see a lot of work, and so this is a personal question in the sense: Do you feel the urge yourself to create? And if you do, <coughs> do you have the time to do it? Do you do it? I have never wanted to be a photographer. No, otherwise, no. When you see, uh, not just photography. <laughs> not just photography. It could be any kind of creative work, right? Even if it's writing or anything. You see a lot of work which yeah. is in the photography world. Mm -hmm. But personally, does it sort of drive you to do any kind of creative work? And Well, yeah. you, know, I'm, you know, I am in a creative field. Like, like my work with, um, with, with PDN is very creative. Because I come from like a painting and a graphic design background, mm -hmm. so I do, um, you know, create on that level. And but, um, you know, I had gone to art school as a painter, but but I don't have an urge to to pick up a paintbrush. But but the thing that feeds me is is my love of photography, and and I'm very happy being in a position of not being a creator, but being a looker, you know, being someone that looks at things and assesses things and, and, and judges things, you know. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. The last question? I don't need the mic, Mami. Um, it's just to I hear see you. most of what you have is for the video. Oh, for the video. <coughs> OK. I see that most of the work that you have is, is generally project-based. Um, do you have interest in? what could be called more quotidian work. I mean, to people like, to use some classic photographers, Saul Leiter or Cartier-Bresson, Kertes, who would go to some place like PhotoFest and, and it would be, well, Mr. Cartier-Bresson, there's some wonderful images here, but, but what's your overarching concept? I don't see any relation between them. Um, I mean, how does that So, yeah, So the I, answer I have is yes, because, cause, well, what, what we've been, <coughs> oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, what what we've done with the gallery, and it's been a fairly recent development. Like during like about the, it's, it's kind of gained gains slowly gaining steam within the last year. Is is we have our represented photographers, and then we have what we call the print room, and and the print room is um, we're opening ourselves to. To, to carry works of photographers that we don't fully represent. Because like the photographers that we represent, w we're interested in being like very hands-on and um, what their career is and, 
and and have a much closer relationship with with the print room artists. Um, we're we're a lot more open minded in terms of what kind of works that, that we carry. Does, does does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yes. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Darren Ching for a wonderful lecture and all of you for coming tonight.